Hello and welcome to 10 Lessons Learned, where we talk to sages and gurus, leaders and luminaries from all over the world to dispense their wisdom for life and career in order to provide you shortcuts to excellence. My name is Robert Hossery and I'm your host for this episode. Our guest today is Keith Rowe. Having joined the workforce as a 16-year-old, Keith Rowe went on to become the Television and Electronic Technicians Institute of Australia's Apprentice of the Year. From there, it was the obligatory national service, graduating from the Army's Officer Training Unit as a second lieutenant, or if you're from another part of the world, a second lieutenant, and completing his two-year obligation as a troop commander within the Royal Australian Signal Field Regiment. Back in the civilian workforce, Keith moved into sales and marketing with EMI, lucky enough to be offered an opportunity of a lifetime with his appointment as inaugural national sales manager for setting up of a Toshiba EMI joint venture. Now that was the forerunner for Toshiba Australia's operation. Eight years later, by then general manager for consumer products for Toshiba Australia, he stood down to form his own company and to pursue consulting and training work. Keith also set up the Australian distributor for Casio as their managing director, the recovery of Sanyo's market position in the early 90s as general manager for sales and marketing, and the restructuring of the Sharp Corporation of Australia as the corporate director and group general manager. Keith has taken his renowned knack of selling program to wherever it was demanded across Australasia and Southeast Asia. He has conducted workshops in close to 100 locations from Sanyo's international headquarters in Osaka, Japan, to a scout hall. Uh, this will be an interesting story. To a scout hall in Outback Australia, involving well over a thousand participants. He has worked across a wide span of market sectors, including computers, sporting goods, jewelry, homewares, telecommunication, electronic components, and too many others to mention here today. Keith Rowe is an active speaker, trainer, and writer. He has published over 100 articles and has an evolving book series, which you can find on Amazon. Hello, Keith, and welcome to the show. Hello, Rob. So, a scout hall in the outback? Yes, it was a small group. It was a telecom retailer, actually, and they wanted bear the people trained in fronting the customer. And as is the case with a lot of technical people, they're very happy being geeks. They're very happy tearing the back off a laptop computer. <laughs> very comfortable. Yep. But you place them out the front of the store, in front of the customer, and all hell breaks loose. They just go to pieces. So the training was essentially selling skills, and as uh, as I've now advanced beyond just basic selling, conversational skills. Well, I mean, the location uh, is what really got me because I, I have been to the outback once. Now, mind you, I've lived in Australia for over fifty years, but I've been there once, and definitely not to train anybody. That's an interesting story, Keith. What we normally do with our guests is we ask a question and every guest we've asked has found it fascinating. So I'm going to ask you the same question. What would you tell your 30 year old self if you had the chance? Well, Rob, that is an awful long time ago. <laughs> we're, we're talking about the mid seventies and uh, that reflects the situation where we were flying to Sheba in Australia. I was jumping on and off aircraft. All I saw day to day were meeting rooms, inside of hotel rooms. I was flitting to and fro from Japan. I was flitting around the country, setting up branches and employing people. And meanwhile, at home, our third child had been born. I had three little children at home and I was working horrendous seven day weeks. So if I could have that all over again, I'd give myself one very special piece of advice. And that would be to create a better mix of home life and work life. Get some balance in there. And uh, as it turned out, uh, a few years after that, about four or five years after that, I actually did advise myself that way. Because one of my kids, my oldest son, came home from school and he said, Dad, I've been selected to play in the junior cricket team at school. Did you ever play cricket? Oh, okay. Now that hit me right in the heart. That was yeah. like a dagger in my heart. Because yeah. in my school years, I had lived for sport and I'd actually played representative sport. I had to forego that. I, I had to forsake those opportunities to uh, cut a living, to get out in the workforce. And so I had not played cricket between the age of 17 and 
34, as it turned out. So I got him involved in cricket. I got his little brother involved in cricket. I decided to make the comeback with the local club in the local competition. My wife became the team scorer. She, by the way, was coaching netball and then getting my daughter involved in representative netball at the same time. So it made an obligation for me to free up weekends. Weekends were strictly for family. I took that decision a few years too late. I should have done it when I was first. But Keith, you did take it. You did take it a lot sooner than a lot of people. And I think that's great advice. Uh, you know, having worked overseas and missed an enormous part of my children's growing up, I, I empathize. I wish that I had told myself that. That's a very important lesson. Well, that's brilliant advice. Let's move on to your 10 lessons. We'll start with lesson number one. Now, I was excited when I saw this because you and I share a passion for this particular lesson. And I won't say any more. I'll just read the lesson and I'll let you explain it because I'm all giddy with happiness that someone else shares the same thought. So lesson number one, the expression knowledge is power is now redundant. Know-how is now the power. Mm, Talk well, to me about that, case. <laughs> well, yes, it is very much a hobby of mine. And it always has been. And knowledge is a funny thing. It's important to have it, not necessarily to use it, but it's important to have it because it creates an aura. People see a knowledgeable person through their attitude. It reflects in their attitude, their level of enthusiasm, the level of confidence. And a, a person possessing knowledge just has that natural ability to mesmerize people. They're wondering how much more could this person possibly know? Mm. But it's subject to dreadful misuse, and I will get to that. Having the knowledge is the important thing, but people don't want to be told what they already know, and they certainly don't want to be told what they don't want to be told. So the discipline of using the knowledge effectively is very important. Now, we don't have to go back very far to where that was the Bogue expression, knowledge is power, because a knowledgeable person we regarded as a person who knew everything, you know, they knew stuff. Then along came the internet, around about the 90s, along came the online environment. Knowledge became more accessible. Suddenly that knowledgeable person wasn't the person who knew everything, but that person who knew how to find out stuff. So the definition tended to change. Welcome to the modern era, a school age, a preschool age children can access the world of knowledge, the encyclopedia of the world, in microseconds, as long as they've got a search engine and an internet connection. So it's gone through another morphing phase. So we've got to the point now where we treat knowledge as something you just get at will. It's, if you want knowledge, you just grab it. You stick right. on your computer, you thumb your phone, you thumb your, and you do what you like, and you've got the knowledge. So it's an at will thing. So knowledge itself is not the power anymore. But what has remained is the need to use it intelligently, to use it thoughtfully mm. and tactfully, because knowledge is only relevant to how much knowledge the other person has. So you have to respectively assume that the other person may or may not know more than you do. So what comes back, we'll talk about this a little later. I'm sure we're going to talk about communication and more feedback. But at this stage, it's about having the respect to do that. And I've got a very good story to tell here. Please, please. Across the world, and it comes back to cricket, funnily enough, because across the sporting world, one of the most revered commentators in all of the cricket playing nations, we're talking from England to Middle Asia, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, across to the West Indies, down to Australia, New Zealand, the most revered commentator that ever lived was a guy called Richie Bono, who died just a few years ago. Richie was a former captain of the Australian cricket team, the national side. And in his television commentary post, he surrounded himself with knowledgeable cricketers, most of whom had already in their past been skippers of the national sides. And the fatherly advice that he gave every single one of them when he welcomed them to the commentary booth was simply this. This is television. This is not radio. Don't let that microphone seduce you into thinking you have to describe everything that's going on. Don't bother telling people what they're going to already see or what they probably already know. And the most important thing you need to learn about being in this commentary box is the value of silence. 
And that, you know, that was incredible advice to be giving these people because generally they wanted to just pontificate about their knowledge of cricket and bore the socks off the listeners. So that was a lesson I got from Richie Bonanno. Well, um, let me let me just interrupt and ask you: How did you get to understand that it's the know-how, it's the use uh, of that knowledge? Yeah, look, it came about always in my inline assignments in management. I was always keen on training, and a lot of it I actually conducted myself. But one of the things that you tend to judge this in a commercial sense: uh, the word competence mm. sort of wraps it up. You judge you judge and evaluate on competence, and Competence is, is kind of a, like a ladder of learning, if you can imagine a, a ladder that's got four rungs. And on the bottom one, you've got this person who's just starting out, right? They are the unconscious incompetent. They don't even know what they don't even know. And they're quite oblivious to it. They take on a bit of training, they advance a little bit, they'll step up to the next rung, where they become the conscious incompetent. They still don't know what they're talking about, but they're now conscious of the fact that they've got a lot more to learn. So they dedicate themselves to it and they move up the ladder. They then become the unconscious competent. They're now competent, they know what they're doing, but they're conscious of having to think about it. They're now at that stage. They know what they know. They know it's probably enough, but they have to consciously think about how they apply it. So they're not at the top level of competence yet. Step up the next one and they become the unconscious competent. In other words, what's happening now is they don't have to think about it anymore. It's all happening automatically. They're totally confident. They have the, the confidence and the enthusiasm. They're at the top rung of the ladder. So I guess you've got to have the knowledge to attain the level, but you've got to have the know-how to retain it. I love to that. stay there. So having the knowledge to get there, having the know-how to stay there. It's That's brilliant. And I, I use that I... in, in training. Yeah, no, I, I love that, Keith. That is a brilliant explanation. And I will repeat it. You've got to have the knowledge to get there. You've got to have the know-how to stay there. Exactly. Love it. I think it's brilliant. But let's move on to lesson number two. EQ trumps IQ every time. So emotional quotient trumps intelligence quotient every time. Tell me your story behind that. Well, basically, we've talked about knowledge. So we're talking, if you expand that and, and involve the know-how, you talk about the cognitive ability now to apply the knowledge, to apply reason to it, to apply logic to it, to work out stuff. And it's terribly technical. It's almost mathematical. And each you do an IQ test, what are you faced with? To talk about numeric sequences and stuff like that. So it's all relating to, we don't want to get into this left and right side of the brain thing, but... This is where it's all working on one side of the brain. It's all on the reasoning and logical side of the brain. And that to me is, is what IQ is all about. And if a person has got a reasonable IQ, then they will be seen as being a knowledgeable sort of person. But the real value of knowledge is to have that emotional intelligence because without being philosophical about it, you know, we're on this planet with no other reason but to get on with all those other people who are on this planet. We're born, one day we die. And what sort of legacy do we have? Some people will set records, some will make music, some will write books, some will leave behind legendary performance accomplishments and so on. Most of us, however, the only legacy we will leave behind is the thought that for God's sake, we mixed with all these people, we treated them fairly and equally, we helped them wherever we could, we made some sort of a contribution. And if I want anything on my damn tombstone, that's what I'd like to see written on. So it's how we relate to the other people. So if we can use the knowledge that we do have, not in a smart aleck format, but in a persuasive way that helps other people, that's when emotional intelligence cuts in. The best way I've seen it portrayed is like a pyramid, a triangle, uh, the pyramid of human understanding, I've seen it called, where the base level of the pyramid is getting to know yourself, know where you come from and the mm. way you think. Step up a notch to the second layer in the pyramid, it's understanding that other person, getting the feedback and having the awareness to know what that other person was thinking and where they're coming from. And when you can tie those two together, you will hit the peak of that pyramid, which is the magic empathy. It's only then that you're exhibiting emotional intelligence. And the model that Goldman came up with many, many years ago, I think it was back in the 1920s, describes it pretty much that way. 
a guy who ultimately became a friend of mine in the US, Tony Alexander, once coined the phrase. He said, uh, I try to live my life by the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He said, but it doesn't work in, in conversations and it doesn't work in selling and it doesn't work in debating and it doesn't work in negotiating because the person doesn't want to be done unto as you want to be done unto. They want to be done unto, unto as they want to be done unto. Oh my God, this is like talking to myself here. Keep going, I love this. Well, we do have matching haircuts. So, <laughs> so maybe it's just a mirror I'm looking at. Or it's just a it could be, I mean, Keith, it could be. And this is... For, for anyone watching this on YouTube, I think you'll get a laugh out of it. For our uh, listening audience, um, watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're brothers in arms. But if you, if you look at how this has been handled, this, this whole issue of emotional intelligence over the years, way back, I think it was Hippocrates, back in the fifth century, started with all with some work on, on personality styles. But it wasn't until Carl Jung, Jung or Jung, depending on where you come from and how you pronounce names. In about the 1920s, he did some serious stuff on personality style. And like most other ways of, of understanding human characteristics, two vectors were used. When they cross, they form four quadrants, and that allowed him to compartmentalize styles. Now, the most recent studies have dealt with the only observable one, and that is behavioral style. If you want to know something about a person's personality, yes, you can duck online and get a, a rudimentary critique of your personality by ticking a few boxes, multiple choice questions. But to do it properly, you would need a clinician to work on it and conduct a serious survey. If you're conversing with somebody or selling with to somebody or negotiating with somebody, you can't say, look, stop here. I want to send you off to the local university. I want you to do a personality study. And when you get the results of all the assimilations, you're going to bring it back here and I'll know how to talk to you. So obviously that can't be done. So did anybody manage to come up with an observable way of, of understanding, particularly behavioral style? Because that's the one thing that people do have a dominant style in, how they behave. And you've probably heard of the DISC system, DISC, yeah. which is the most common of all the formats and dominance, inducement, you know, and uh, submission, compliance, blah, blah, blah. I came across a different version of that. It was called the Social Style Group back in the 70s. And it was done by a couple of US uh, professors, David Merrill and Roger Reed. And they came up with a, a way to measure assertiveness and responsiveness, the more assertive person is one who will sort of lean forward in conversation and flip their opinion more readily. The less assertive is the one that hangs back, a bit reserved, almost aloof. Then the vertical line, you've got a, a totally different thing, responsiveness. The responsive person is the person who's emotionally involved, the people issues, they cry in sad movies. Whereas the non-sociable person up the top there, the less responsive person, is rather aloof and matter of fact about things. When you cross those, you get four quadrants and they define so accurately the characteristics of, a, of an individual. So that study of behavioral style is something that has since been used. It's been used to put together boards of directors for companies. It's been used to put together, I guess, marriages even. It's been used to put together management teams. And I've no doubt that it's probably even avoiding wars somewhere. So behavioral style has become one of the most expressive ways of having emotional intelligence and training it and having people understand it. And it's not about getting individuals to be putting people in boxes. It's about simply having them understand that we're all different. We're yeah. so unique. We're absolutely unique people. And you must not assume that the other person is going to see things exactly as, as yeah. you see them. They're not going to regard it the same way you do. They're not going to value it the same way you do. So I use it in training and we do the putting in boxes, yes. But I, I always quantify the whole thing. I qualify the, the end result, the outcome as being, don't worry about the boxes. Just go into the conversation, go into the negotiation, go into the debate, appreciating that that person won't necessarily see it the way you do. So never make that assumption. That That's is emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. And that is such an important lesson. Assuming that someone sees a problem, an issue, a situation the same way you do, one is the height of arrogance and two is dumb.
I mean, I will just straight out say it. It's it's a ridiculous place to be because, as you pointed out, we are all different. And that little anecdote about the golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you, I couldn't agree more. You know, we are yeah. all different. Not everyone wants to be treated the way you want to be treated. So think about that. What a brilliant lesson. What a brilliant lesson. Okay, lesson number three, the new business opportunity customer service now hang on keith we we have customer service what do you mean it's a new business opportunity well it's new in the context that let's start with the definition of customer service okay on the one hand you've got an expectation the customer has an expectation on the other hand there's a level of delivery against that expectation if we exceed their expectation we've got a satisfied customer if we fail to reach that to achieve that, we have a very dissatisfied customer. True. Now, it's mathematical. It's an equation. It's a simultaneous equation. So what a lot of the big corporates have been doing in terms of customer service, they've determined that it's much easier and cheaper to lower the customer's expectation rather than invest in upping their delivery of service. Well, now, doesn't, because, hang on, doesn't that come from that old adage, under promise and over deliver? That, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's a good way to summarize it. You've just summarized everything I wanted to say for the next 45 minutes. So now I can cut this fairly short, Rob, because when you're looking at that, that customer service expectation, there's some classic examples. Let's start with the banks. Now, I'm going to be a little facetious here, and I'm a little tongue-in-cheek, so don't take it at face value straight away. I will summarize. But have a look at the banks. There once was a thing called a bank teller, a lovely lady or gentleman who knew our children's names, they counted all the money on the counter for us. My God, they even paid us some interest on our hard-earned savings. Look at us now. Along came the ATM. We were happy to stand out in the rain, in the queue, waiting for our turn to do the job ourselves, draw money which we own, upon which we are earning no interest, and then even accept a transaction charge for being good enough to do it ourselves. That's the banks, right? Now, Fortunately, they have seen the light a little bit after the horror of all their branch closures and the uproar that it caused. They now seem to have a concierge at the door and they're taking a different tack. But leave the banks alone for a moment. Let's go to the grocers, the supermarket. There once was a thing called a grocer. They wore those lovely dust coats. They would select the goods off the shelf for us. They would put them into environmentally brown paper bags for us. And God help us, they even carried the car for us. My God, where's the grocer gone? Now we go to the supermarket, we select a trolley. Somehow they've programmed that trolley to take every direction except the one we want to go. And when we finally do get to, to the checkout, we've got to scan it ourselves. And if we don't do it quite right, somebody will come up quite ill mannerly, never so pleased. The machine will say, I'm going to have to get an exasperated staff member over here to do this for you by the little band. So that happens. That's only the tip of the iceberg. Next, we're going to have radio technology, which will automatically read what's in our trolley, automatically bill it as we walk past to our bank account through our phone, and they'll take it to another dimension. And I haven't even started on the service station. I don't know that any of your listeners are old enough to remember when you could pull up at a service station and a kindly lady or gentleman would come and fill the tank with fuel, check the oil, check the water, clean the windscreen, and then take you inside so you could pay for it. But what is, what's the connection there? Well, how is this a new business opportunity? Well, 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 this, this is happening. A new opportunity arises where there are still some products other than the commodity level, mm -hmm. which needs to be sold. They, people need to find the solution. They need to have a product recommended. Anything medical, technical, mechanical, things where you, you need to understand the solution, have an appropriate product allocated to it. That's still room for selling. Now, within those industries where it hasn't been commoditized, that's a fantastic opportunity because most of the bigger players are downgrading their level of service, downgrading the expectation. There's a very easy opportunity to stand tall and be the one that lifts the level of service, and it can be done affordably. So a lot of my trainees have walked away from my session shaking their head saying, look, this old guy's not with it. This is how the world works these days. They've come up with a new business model because they had to reduce costs and it's all within their business plan and it's working for them. This is all great. But then it's, by the time we're finished, most of them leave the room thinking, my God, I get back to my store or my workshop or my whatever. 
I think I can make an opportunity out of this because that big fella down the road is doing exactly what we just talked about. That's an excellent observation. If you look at business today, it is all cookie cutter. A lot of companies are pretty much the same. Your, your e-commerce is pretty much the same platform everywhere. In our current environment, particularly the online environment, you're constantly searching for a point of difference. Yeah. In a technical type, other than commodity type sale, that obvious point of difference is personal intervention personal head-to-head, -head, face to face, voice to voice help. And that's a point of difference. And quite often it's the only point of difference. It becomes impossible to differentiate some of these deals because the product looks the same. Yeah. The photo even used to sign photograph in their online library. I mean, there's no point of difference whatsoever. So what happens by default, price becomes the only point of difference. And all that does is demolish the profitability of both the branded supplier and the retailer. I'm not taking sides against the consumer here because the downward spiral of pricing is obviously good for the consumer, but it decimates the business model. It decimates all the, the planning of the business model. Yeah. That yeah. point of difference may be the only point of difference in the future. I hope that that resonates with our listener. I hope that that point is not lost and I would recommend very strongly to pause this podcast, go back, uh, listen to lesson number three again, so you can fully understand what Keith is saying. It is an opportunity. Okay, well, let's move on to lesson number four, because it, it can be contentious, but I think I understand what you're saying here. So I'll, I'll let you explain it. So lesson number four, discrimination versus equality. They're totally different things. Yes, it's going to be contentious. <laughs> Let's start with the whole issue of political correctness, or as, it, as it's called, the, the PC offensive. Now, the truest thing about that is the use of the word offensive, because it is downright offensive, because it's been taken so much out of context. Because somewhere along the line, if you look at discrimination, the, the Oxford Collins Dictionary, the definition of the word is the differentiation between two or more things, between two or among more things. It's, that's all it is, that's discrimination, but we've somehow got it in our mind that all discrimination is evil. And indeed a lot of it is, and it's gotta be quashed. I'm, not, well, I'm all for that, it's, it's gotta be absolutely squashed. But equality is a different thing. Now we say, oh, equality, equality. We're not born equal, we're a different shape, we're different sizes, we have different coloring, our color palette is completely different, our hair color is different. You and I don't have an issue with that because we haven't got any. <laughs> but our color of our eyes is different. The color of our race, importantly, is different. Our skin, our race. These are things to celebrate. The French say, viva la différence. They're, they're to celebrate, not to denigrate. And yet, what are we doing all the time? We're, we're confusing sameness with equality. We're saying we need to be the same. We don't want to be the same. We're not the same. So please let us be what we are and celebrate it. Don't go insulting it. The biggest issue with that is some of the terminology used. I'm sure a lot of it's taken out of context because there are certain words that in, a, in, the, in their own way are offensive. And I think you and I at some stage have discussed that aspect of it as well. But I just don't like the fact that there seems to be some confusion between equality. We're not born the same. We're not supposed to be this equal, but humanitarian terms, in humanitarian terms, we need to be treated equally. That's what this is all about. So I'm all for equality, whether it be gender, race, color, size, shape, disability, you name it. We need to be treated fairly and we need to be treated equally. But well, let me pick up on, on that. Maybe then it's the use of the term equality. I mean, I'm with you with discrimination. Discrimination, the, the pure meaning of the word is to discriminate, is to separate two different things. I understand that. We have changed that terminology in society, and we'll talk about that later, maybe, maybe not. But the, the word equality, I think if we start using the word equity instead of equality, that might be a better solution. Because, you know, I come from a privileged background. I understand the privileges that, that I have, have been afforded in society, but people who haven't come from that privileged base, they need more help to get to the same level 
Mm. And that's equity. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they're better. It doesn't mean very I'm better. Good, very good point. So equity is a good choice of word. We're, we're both equal because we're both human, but we need to have an equitable society where everybody, this is my own personal soapbox. So if you're going to write in, write in to me because it's yeah. about, you know, this is my thoughts, but we need to have an equitable society that treats everyone according to their needs. Look, you're really touching one of my holy verses now too. And that is that again, without being too philosophical, we know the start of life. We damn sure know the end of life. Yes, so we we're do. only really talking about the journey. If we can make that journey closer in equity for all of us, so that at least there's some opportunity drawing close to equality along the way, that's going to be an enormous gain. But we're so far from it. We are. But we're disappointingly so far from that. And uh, the disadvantaged, in many respects, seem even more disadvantaged than they have been in the past. But in some of the cases, gender, for example, we've made progress. I mean, the glass ceiling is still there in, in certain things. We know all that sort of thing, but we are making some progress. Started with the suffragettes over a hundred years ago, and it's still gaining momentum. So hopefully we'll get over that one. But we've I, got bigger issues with spiritual relief. We've got bigger issues with racial relief. So they need a lot of work. It does. And it's a topic that we can discuss forever. I do want to move on, but I do want to touch on this one point because you, you mentioned political correctness and how it's being usurped by the discussion of discrimination. I do agree with some of that because there are people who willfully use terminology to profile, to do what they need to do to encourage that hatred and that rift and that disintegration of society. But I will also say I've come to realize very recently that the choice of words, and many of our speakers have said this, and I know that Keith, that you would probably also agree with this, that there is power in the words you choose. Yes. There's a lot of power in the word you choose. I remember as a young schoolboy, and we're talking in the seventies here in Australia, the language we used is totally different to the language I would even think of using today. The jokes we told, I would never even catch myself talking that way or telling those uh, jokes. Not that they were blue, but they were. They were insulting, many of them. Very insulting Sorry. and racially profiled yes. to different ethnicities, different races. And it's the removal of that language from the vocabulary that changes your mindset. If you keep using the derogatory terms, if you keep using, I'll give an example. I refer to indigenous people as indigenous people, first nation people, native Americans. I don't refer to them by the the common term that is being used that changes your thinking about these cultures. This is my opinion anyway, but that's why when, when you said PC, that's where I went. There are times when I believe that we should have some political correctness, but not to the, yeah. not to the extent where it, it's gone mad. But some of it is it's touching on the absurd. Uh, we, we, we know that, but the phraseology I'm pleased with the changes. I'm very, very pleased with the upgrading of the, of the use of the phraseology. But if I were to create a motto for, for everything that I stand for there, I would say integrate and celebrate yeah. rather than isolate and denigrate. Very it's, nice. It's almost that simple. And that's a catchphrase I used in my latest book. And, and to me, that encapsulates pretty much all the way I think about it. Just, just say that one more time. We'll move on to the next lesson, but I want to leave this one with that saying. Integrate and celebrate rather than separate and denigrate. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Okay. Lesson number five, be skilled at having conversations. Now, Keith, we all know how to have conversations. Why do we need to be skilled at it? Well, again, I'm going to go back to basics. The communication model. Remember I said at some stage, no matter the complexity of the communication, at some stage of it, it gets down to one person delivering a message, another person receiving it. And if we want to know if it's been received correctly, you've got to have some feedback, right? But yeah. we can avoid the need for feedback in the way we present conversations. And I break them in two halves, the presentation skills, the outward bound skills, and the receptive skills. And, and quite frankly, I think the receptive skills are more important. But with the outward bound skills, I break it into what I call the three Bs, verbal, vocal, and visual. 
So let's just take a, a moment for each of those. Verbal skills are the words that we use. And I'm not talking about having a, an English schoolmaster vocabulary at, at, at will, not at all, because we want to be appropriately talking to people uh, at an appropriate level. I'll give you an example of this. A product manager who worked for me some years ago, he's quite technically brilliant. He used to look after products like camcorders and in the days of video recorders, that type of equipment, and he was quite brilliant. But he had a lot of trouble with public speaking because in that role, he was often having to make presentations, talking to groups of people. And he had come from a, a fairly disadvantaged background, a rural background, a rather poor family. And probably during preschool years, he had picked up some habits, the wrong verb forms, for example. He would say things like, I come into the room or I see him more, he done it. So I give it to him. Right. So we're using the wrong tense, the wrong form of words and so on. And you could see when this was happening, you could see the audience absolutely cringing. They were judging him. They weren't judging him on his technical brilliance or his knowledge of, of the industry and the products that he was presenting. They were judging him purely on the way he conducted his English, the way he expressed himself. Now, we got together in one of the usual performance appraisal sessions, the annual salary review thing, and we talked quite openly about this, and he finished up writing down for all those action verbs, to be, to give, to do, and so on, he wrote down the correct verb forms, the correct tense, today I do, yesterday I did, I have done, and he carried it around his pocket until he got it right, until it became instinctive. Now, that guy, I'm sure, is still as brilliant as he ever was in the job that he does, but he's probably not being unfairly judged for all the wrong reasons. Look, it's not any particular strata of something. It's just being compatible with your audience and not giving them an opportunity to judge you wrongly because it affects your credibility and the, the whole way you do things. And the other thing is jargon. Now, I work with geeks. I mean, most of my trainees are these brilliant technical guys who fall to pieces in front of a customer, mind you, but they're, they're absolutely brilliant technically. And jargon flows off the tongue. Everything's bits and bytes. Huh? And to the customer, it means absolute gobbledygook. They'll be talking technical terms that they, they're quite familiar with, but they don't necessarily get it 100% right. And some of their customers may well have a PhD in that discipline. They could get caught out very badly. So my advice to them is forget the jargon, come up with case studies and, and, and friendly storylines to explain the meaning of things and get away from the technical terms. And on top of that, don't use slang. There's no need for profanity. The English language has got enough words in it without having to swear. So just use a little bit of discipline there, out with the jargon, out with the slang, out with the profanity and in with the gracious use of the language. So that's only the verbal. And we get to the vocal. What about the vocal? We can change the whole mood of a conversation by accent, tone, timing, even volume. You know, if we want to talk about something secretively, perhaps even intimately, we lower our voice. It's got a lot of effect on somebody who's hard of hearing, isn't it? So the first rule is we're not chasing the Shakespearean chalice here. We're not on the stage performing. Make sure people can hear you. Make sure points aren't getting lost because you're not enunciating loudly enough. The other thing is talking too quickly. Unless you work at McDonald's and you're a young teenager, then don't come up with a mile of the way of the dance. It's, it's a critical issue. And, and if we get to talk on the receptive skills, I'll talk about that as a feature of listening. Because if we get excited about something, we invariably talk faster and we'll lose the person we're trying to talk with. It's far better to have a, a moderated tone, a moderated speed and keep it consistent and then you'll be understood. The most important one yet to come. Do you, do you know what it is? The most important word in any language is the pause. And the secret to a pause, if you're a public speaker or MC or whatever you're doing, the pause is the most valuable tool you'll ever have because a pause will always do two things. One, it captures the attention. People think, oh my God, I may have missed something. The silence gets it. I may have missed something. Or alternatively, oh boy, I think there's something important coming up. So they're, they're recognizing that that pause is causing them. Did I miss something? Or am I about to miss something? And it attracts attention. The greatest attention getter in conversational mode 
is to follow us. It's the most valuable word in the language. That's great. And I would strongly advise anybody listening to start honing those conversational skills. Well, we'll take a quick break at the moment. We'd like to thank our affiliate partner, Audible. Audible is an amazing way to consume 10 Lessons Learned, books, and other podcasts, allowing you to build a library of knowledge all in one place. You can start your free 30 day, yes, that's right, I said free 30 day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash 10 lessons learned. You'll gain access to the works of many of our guests and you'll be able to listen to our podcast and much more. With Audible, you can listen to new and favorite authors, even authors like Keith Rowe, while at home or on the go. Once again, that's audibletrial.com slash 10 lessons learned or lowercase for a free 30 day trial. And the link will be in the show notes. So today's guest is Keith Rowe. And we'll get back to Keith with lesson number six. Keith, lesson number six says, don't just talk, question, listen, and watch. We've had a lot of guests who talk about the importance of listening, but I'm a, a little taken aback with question and watch when you throw that into the listening mix. Doesn't that not take away from listening? No, well, no, it doesn't, because the question will, will attract uh, what you have to listen to, and the, the question will define what you need to, to be listening to. But Let's, let's take it back again. You've got to get back to that feedback thing. But as far as questioning skills are concerned, I was taken aback when I first started doing serious training in this, maybe selling oriented training. But even so, when you talk questioning skills, I, I would sit the trainees down and I would say, look, turn to your partner next to you and ask them as many questions as you can, which they cannot answer with a simple yes or no answer. And they stutter and they stammer and they might get to one or two until I introduce something which ironically comes from an old English author, Rudyard Kipling. I usually get this in the wrong order, but he said something like, once I kept six worldly men, they taught me all I knew. Their names were what and when and where and why and how and who. Any question that you ask, starting with one of those words, cannot be reasonably answered with a yes or no. And if you throw in which, it actually makes seven. Another W word. So when you have the W words, in the house, once I do that, they will turn to their partner and almost indefinitely be asking questions that can't be answered with this or no. These are what we call open questions. And the open questions are designed to attract information, to get responsive, valuable information, and to, I guess, promote the continuity in the conversation. So when we do want to get a, a response, yes or no, we use a direct question, don't we? That's how we do it, isn't it, right? And they're the active verbs, like is, does, and so on. So having the ability to ask those open questions, to get information, then the ability to dovetail at the right time, the right place, you know, the conversation, the direct question to get a response, the feedback you want, is the true art of conducting a conversation. The true art, as you would know, of conducting an interview as well. So... That really is the whole thing with questioning. And there are certain types of question which are absolutely invaluable. So you shouldn't answer a question with a question. That's what politicians do, but it's not so. Answering a question with a question is a terrific way of taking a particular topic and putting it to bed and then getting on with the rest of the conversation. So there are techniques in there, and I've got at least half a dozen folders of mine, that are a type of question that will allow you to steer the conversation in a non manipulative way. And you can use those techniques. Okay. Then you've got to listen to it. Okay. I'll get to the listening in a minute. I, I understand the questioning. Why do I need to watch? Well, the ultimate lie detector. What happens within the, the, <laughs> the body is that the subconscious brain, apart from control of all our motor skills and so on, it controls pretty much everything that we do. Now, Rob, I'll ask you now, for example, to cross your arms. And you probably can't see it so can cross your arms. Most right-handers would do that with the right hand over the left. Now, I'm going to ask you to uncross them and cross them the other way around. And some people can't even do it. They've got to think how the hell do I do no, that? No, that's exactly the same. No, yeah. 
I would have to, yeah, I got it. I got it. No, I got it. You achieve that. The very next time you go to cross your arms, you will do it the same old way because your subconscious brain is programmed to do all that. Mm. And your conscious brain cannot control it. So body language will give out signs that reflect the true response that you have. It is a virtual lie detector. And there have been some brilliant books written on one by an Australian uh, guy, Alan Peace. He's quite famous for his work on body language. But once I used this in the training session, I said I'll get involved with some of the things like territory, space, eye contact, all that sort of thing. Once they experienced it, they said, my God, I can't believe. Well, I've been living in an invisible world. Why haven't I seen all these things happening? And quite often you can lead an entire conversation without even uh, speaking. So you cannot totally master those hidden forces with the body language. Okay. It's a well, lie detector. It, it's a lie detector. And it actually is. If you stop and think about it, that was lesson number six. And I think very valuable and definitely skills that you need to learn and practice and hone. Let's so, move on to now, lesson. Now, Rob, just before we do move on, sorry, just one thing that I think can't be left out. Okay. And that is hearing versus listening. Now, hearing is a biological thing. Truck goes past whether you want to hear it or not, you hear it. The body hears it. Your hearing system, if it works and you don't have a hearing disability, it hears it. Listening, however, is a skill that can be learned. And the reason for this is that when we talk, we talk at something around 150 words a minute. Our brain is capable of taking in speech and processing it at up to 700 words a minute. So there's a massive void to fill, and that leads to boredom and lack of attention. We also have a, a window of attention of about 45 seconds. If it's not stimulated, we die of boredom and we stop listening. So the differentiation means that we have to concentrate on our listening. And there's a set of listening skills, everything about not interrupting, everything about maintaining the eye contact, all those positives that you should do to become a good listener. And being a bad listener can actually be quite offensive to whoever you're talking with. And I'll just give one example because I don't want to string this out, but one example is what I call pencil listening. You're talking with somebody and suddenly the eye contact goes, they start writing on a bit of paper or tapping on a tablet and you're trying to talk to them. You're trying to tell them something and they're completely, they're not even maintaining eye contact. And that's very offensive. After a while, you actually stop talking. You stop giving them information because you're too offended by it. When it's so simple that if I said, Rob, these are important things you're telling me. I really do need to make some notes. Do you mind if I just make a few notes while you describe that for me? Once you seek their permission, you can do no evil. But unless you do that, it's just plain of flooding. And that's just one example of positive listening that a lot of people just simply aren't aware of. And there are a number of uh, little secrets to good listening like that. Absolutely brilliant. Let's go on to lesson number seven. Persuasion is a matter of style. Conviction <laughs> is a matter of process. Keith, over to you. Correct. No doubt in what you do, you've met many, many people, I'm sure, that they had you hanging on every word. Sadly, I'm not one of them, but I'm sure you've come across many of them. And you can't help but wonder, oh, my God, this person, I'm just hanging on their every word. What is it that they're doing? Is it, do they have a degree of charm? Maybe, maybe they've they been blessed with a little bit of charm and they've got that persuasive manner about them. They, they might have a, a good vocabulary and a wonderful style about them. And I call that persuasion as opposed to conviction. Conviction is just a process. For example, if you want to convince somebody of something, I might, for example, say, I've got a good technique, which is called the fab technique. And Rob, it's a terrific technique. You know, that's all I've said. Rob, it's a terrific technique. You will then pause and say, well, hang on, how do I know that? Ho hum, you know, tell somebody who cares, right? But if I were to use a technique, a conviction technique, that not only makes a claim or a promise like that, but su supports it with a, a feature, then supports that with an advantage, what advantage does that give you? Then in turn, does that advantage give you a personal benefit? And if I string that together and make it, it's just a simple sentence, and it starts with the word because. This is a great process because it will keep you convincing in that you will always offer the advantage. It will make you even more convincing because you will then convert that to a personal benefit. It will make you even more convincing if you add an example on it. For example, I've just done that sentence in that format that I was talking about. 
giving you a reason to take on board what I'm saying by taking it right out to a personal benefit to you and then even giving an example. Now, that's a very common conversational technique, and it's particularly pertinent to public speaking, where quite often you're up at a lectern, you've got a massive audience out there, and apart from trying to see their reactions, you can't get feedback. This is a wonderful way to eliminate the need for feedback. You don't make a point unless you take it to the nth degree. Now, in its basic form, it's called the fab technique, but in its more sophisticated form, I call it the conviction thread. And it's what I train a lot of the, the salespeople and managers to do. And that's the process. So you combine the two, that persuasive money you've got, that use of language that you have, that ability to present that you have, and you put it into a, a little train line of conviction. And the key to it are the linking words between. To convert it from a promise to a fact is the word because. And use the word because, you can use your own terminology in doing this, but the word because is the critical thing. Because, such a common word, because it's used over and over again, and because it doesn't offend anybody, because they hear it all the time. So the word because is not affronting because they hear it so often. People are used to hearing it repetitively, so it becomes the starting point. You don't tell them something that you want them to know unless you add the cause. You give them the why factor as well as the how, which, when, and so on. Give them the why factor. Yeah. In my sales cadet days, we were taught to listen to WIIFM. What's in it for me? That's exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Lesson number eight. Do you think versus do you feel? <laughs> They're very different things, don't you think? Or do you feel they're the same? <laughs> so let me just explain what I'm getting at here. This stems pretty much from a lot of my sales training material, but it's a conversational thing. It, 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 it applies to any damn thing, a barbecue, a picnic, wherever you are. When you press for a decision, people know that they've got to make a decision. There's a certain amount of stress involved in that. And if you apply it negatively, like using the word don't, don't you think that's a good idea? A couple of things happen. First, they get their back up. They think, well, he doesn't think I believe it. They could think, he thinks I'm an idiot. Why is he talking to me like that? Don't you think? Implying that I don't know anything. So if I were to come to you and say, well, do you feel that's a good idea? I'm not asking you or pressing you for a decision. I'm asking for your, for your opinion. Yeah. And people are more than happy to give you their opinion of it, yeah. whether you want it or not. So if you're trying to take a, get a take on how a conversation is going, a debate or a sale or whatever's going on, a negotiation and statement, you're running in a feel on it. It's actually got to turn it over. It's called a trial close. Not, that, not trying to close the sale. You're trying to get feedback. You're trying to get a feel for it, feel it for it. So that technique is so friendly and, and it will attract all the positive or negatives. They're not necessarily going to agree with you. But you'll get the negative. You'll even get an objection in its nice, friendly form, and you can handle it without any you know, antagonism going on. So that's a conversational thing that I even taught my grandchildren. I'm not joking. This this is an everyday thing. This has got nothing to do with with commerce or selling or negotiating. This is an everyday conversational thing. If you want to have a an interactive conversation and get the appropriate response, use the word "do." Use the word "feel." Don't use the word don't and don't use the word think because pressing for a decision creates stress and creates unpleasantness. Asking for an opinion is simply friendly and it's simply polite. It's a style of conversing. So rather than saying, what do you think? You say, how, how do you feel about how that? How do you feel? So you, even, even if you don't use the don't, and you say, what, what do you think? No, I'll say, oh, do you? Oh, hang on, I've got to think about this. <laughs> and if you say, well, what do you feel about that? It's asking. I'll tell you my life story, for God's sake, because it's friendly. You're asking in a, a favourable, friendly manner, for my opinion. And Look, I'll see, certainly give it. See, our lessons come from everywhere. This is a very simple, short lesson, but it's so powerful. Oh, yes. It's it is. It is so powerful. It's a life skill. It's not a negotiating skill. It's not a selling skill. It's a life skill. All right. Well, let's move on to lesson number nine. And this is one that I'm not going to comment on because I, again, it's like your first lesson. I totally agree with this. There is a difference between leadership versus management. Now I know some of our audience might go, yeah, I know, but I ask you, do you really know? <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's just break it down a little bit. 
the the issue of leadership versus management. If you if you've got an action plan, you, you know about a commercial team, right? And a manager's out running a plan, you know, tell me how I want it done, and where I want it done, and when I want it done, and what equipment to use, and, and he's chasing an outcome. It doesn't inspire you necessarily. It simply gives you a set of instructions that you need to follow. The difference between a manager doing that and the leader is simply this. The leader will explain why we're doing it. The secret is in the why, because it's the why that inspires and motivates you to do it and to do it well. So the secret there is in the why. Now, if you go back in time, we've, we've tried to characterize this, this leadership thing in so many different ways, it's embarrassing. But X and Y, do you remember the days it's called X, the autocratic and the Y was the democratic? And then we went to a situational leadership where we decided we should adopt either a parent to parent relationship or a parent to child relationship. All these wonderful things came out of Harvard over the years, trying to define what leadership is really all about. And to be quite honest, some of it was quite embarrassing. But I've got a very good case study in my own background because I did do a little stint in the military. I was a, a platoon commander and I had a responsibility. Fortunately, it didn't come to be, not in an action environment. I didn't go overseas. But I was certainly trained with the, the maintaining the life of these people, these 30 young soldiers. When you talk autocratic leadership, we put through it. We say there's no room for that. You know, we've got to have a meeting, we've got to get consensus. Japanese were masters at that. They'd always get a consensus before the decision, so there was never a bad outcome at the end of it, because they'd all agreed beforehand. And that was what they, I think remember they called it Nemawashi. And that was the secret behind that brilliant production engineering. Involve everybody in making the decision, then nobody can conflict with it when it's done. So, so autocratic leadership, however, you come under fire. You're a platoon of soldiers, you suddenly come under fire. Do those soldiers lying in the mud really want you to call a meeting? Do they really want to put their two bucks worth into the meeting and give their opinion? Of course not. They want you to stand up, mark orders, get the machine guns positioned correctly, get the fire returned and protect their lives. If we were in a building together and it caught fire, we wouldn't want somebody to say, let's have a meeting and we'll determine what we're going to do. You'd want somebody to stand up pick up a chair, smash it through the plate glass window and say, follow me, people. That's autocratic leadership. So in times of immediacy, danger, desperation and extreme need, autocratic leadership does have a place. The true leader is the person who can put the two together, know exactly when it calls for an autocratic approach and when it calls for a democratic approach. And in most commercial environments, the democratic is the way to go. There's no question of it because there's, there's so many advantages to it. But uh, too many people dismiss the autocratic style as being redundant. It's not. There's a, there are circumstances where it's absolutely necessary. So those are the, the two styles that, that I've sort of got used to working with and differentiating. And a lot of people ask me about the difference. How do you see the autocratic style versus the democratic? And that's pretty much how I explain it. Immediacy, danger, extreme need, threat. Whenever that is present, it calls for an autocratic approach. Somebody wants somebody to take the lead. Well, we spoke about the different types of leadership. You mentioned management, but I want to make it very clear. Management is process driven. Management yes. is a how to. Leadership is why. Why? It's all about the why. Yep. All right. Well, give the reason. The reason the, the why gives the inspiration and provides the motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Well, that leads us to the tenth and final lesson, and then I'll have one more question for you. But the tenth and final lesson: the long-term challenges of preserving relationships are. I don't know what they are, Keith, because I can't say that I've had a long-term relationship and what is it that you mean by long-term well this can be long-term relationship in business your clients long-term clients it can be in a long happy marriage and i've been married for 125 years no, it's not really it's, it's <laughs> over, well over 50, 54 years something like that well, and, the same, and the same woman right but and ironically, it was in a business session that we actually strayed on. We almost turned it into a marriage counseling session because I wanted to talk about the, the viability of a business here, Mr. It's retaining clients. 
client retention is what business is really all about. Yeah. It's the true measure. It's the essence of business. And we started to equate it. And I had a mixed, a mixed group of trainees, ladies and, and men, all mixed up. And we strayed on to a marriage counseling session. I said, well, does it equate to, you know, relationships, uh, female, male relationships or everything in between? Does it, interpersonal relationships, does it equate to that? And I thought, well, let's have a look at it because it goes through stages, doesn't it? And we distilled out of all this, this round table discussion, three L's, and I put them up on the whiteboard. How does it start? It starts with lust. What does it grow into? If you're lucky, it grows into another little love. And that's sustained for a long period of time. Eventually that wanes a little bit, you know, and that becomes loyalty. So you're morphing through three stages of the relationship. So we broke that back down and we put that into the context of a client relationship. Now the lust is lust in a personal relationship is not quite the same as your first day on a new job yeah. or your first interview with a new client. Certainly not. But there's a degree of excitement there. There's, there's the newness and the excitement of it. So there is still a lust phase. Once the relationship is formed, trust comes into it, a, a genuine deeper thing comes in. You call it love, comes into it, and that can sustain over a long period of time. If it goes on long enough, you get to the point where it's, it's a bit like that confidence thing. It's almost automatic and it's held together with loyalty. There's a, such a degree of loyalty and trust that everything else is forsaken. So if you've got a problem with that relationship, and I've, I'm, I'm a marriage counsel, so let's keep it on a business level. If you've got an issue with that, you can have a look at what stage the relationship's at and have a look at that L palette and see which one of them might be deficient and apply that one. Do you need to put a bit more lust back in it? Do you need to re-energize it, put some excitement back in it? Do you need to consolidate that, that trust in the relationship, the love component? Or have we just become a bit stale and we're just relying now on the loyalty and maybe you've got to inject something else? And you can look at it, which L's missing and put that L back in. So we came up with a, a reasonable formula. It's not ideal, but no, it's, it's certainly... No, no, I, I like it, Keith, but what dawns on me when I hear that, and I think it's, it's a great way to look at relationships. And I'm just talking business relationships. I mean, I know it works everywhere, but let's just keep it with business. I look at business relationships and I look at the, the situation we're all in now, the so-called quiet quitting, great resignation, whatever the hell you want to call it. And it makes me think that maybe you're missing an L because if we don't get to loyalty, then there's resentment that's going to be built up, which could lead to loathing. Well, it could. It could be the one negative. It, now, it really you could be. The important things you're saying here, Rob. No, I'm going to add that one. Loathing. That puts a new, puts a negative connotation. It, it does. And I don't mean to do that, but I'm just taking what you've said and looking at the situation now. Why are so many people leaving so I'm looking at it from the context of our society today. Why would people leave their jobs? Why would they do that? So that that's where I, I'm getting the fourth L from. That's where I'm getting loathing oh, from. Yeah. If they're not looking after their relationship by using your three L's, maybe yeah. they're causing that fourth that L, fourth or maybe L. they've just got a bad leader or a bad manager. <laughs> well, the other L is leadership, of course. Yeah. But, but Invariably, if you go therapy and deeper in there, there'll be a leadership issue. There's absolutely no doubt there'll be a leadership issue behind it. So, uh, and uh, we, we really don't have, like, I guess, the time to go into a lot of the, the details of that leadership thing. But I did cover it in the book, no free commercials, but it is in great detail in the book. And if they put another way, they put two L's in or put in loathing, which requires leadership to take it to loyalty, as it's saying. Lust, love, Effective leadership, loyalty. We'll put a fourth one in. Love it. Thank you for that. Let's uh, end up on this final question to you, Keith. What have you unlearned? Uh, you know that unlearning is a lot more difficult than learning, don't you? That's unlearning. why we ask the question. Anything that you have unlearned is well, just as valuable as the lessons that you have learned. Well, there's one thing that I, I might have possibly even unlearned it by now. But one thing that plagued me for a long time, I had this intrinsic belief that everything that you need to, to do must be rational. There must be a reason for it. There must be a rational reason to 
do it. Everything was determined by logic, had to be a reason. But what I've learned, particularly since I've become a professional lawyer, since I retired from the full-time workforce and started to realize that there's an enjoying life that doesn't involve working, I've now come to the belief that perhaps I should unlearn that, that belief is ill-founded because some of the most enjoyable things you will ever do in your life have no rhyme or reason or logic associated with them. Absolutely not. They're done for the pure pleasure and enjoyment, not just of yourself, but the pure pleasure and enjoyment of others. And it doesn't involve reason and it doesn't involve logic. I think I've nearly unlearned it, but I haven't done it yet. So that's what I really want to get rid of. Unlearned it completely. Hmm. That's a very interesting one, Keith. That's, uh, and, and it's unique. We've never had that before. <laughs> that is a very interesting That's... one. Well, look, I, I want to leave the audience with, with this anecdote. Keith and I worked together briefly in the 80s. And when we developed this podcast, I had Keith in my mind because I remember being a young manager and Keith saying you know, something to me, which Today is like a, a cliche, but I had never, ever heard of this before. And we're sitting there, we're having a discussion and Keith says, work smarter, not harder. And I just thought, this man's a guru. This man is, you know, is the, <laughs> the, sage, <laughs> the sage of all sages because I'd never heard it. So when we were putting this podcast together, that's the anecdote that came to mind. That's how I felt. And I'm sure that when we were discussing it, we said, there's a lot of lessons that people have that through experience that young rising leaders have never heard of that don't know, and that could change the course of their career, the course of their life or what have you. And I'll tell you, Keith, it did change the way I started to think. It made me more strategic. It made me more aware of how to be a better business professional. So I want to give you on air credit for being a catalyst for 10 lessons learned. So from me to you, thank you, Keith. Sure. Very nice to you. So we'll leave it at that. But before I sign off, what is it that Keith Rowe is doing? Where can we find your book? What's happening? What's it called? Okay. There is the book. I coined the, the word. It's a interpersonality, which is indicating interpersonal skills. The whole purpose of the book, uh, it does adopt a lot of my earlier selling and negotiating material, but it's, it's aimed at a, quite a different audience. It's all about conf conversational skill and it's aimed at addressing the threat that we now face that those skills are being lost because of the transition to online hmm. and it's been accelerated by COVID. My last meaningful book was released in 2019 just before the arrival of COVID. And along came COVID, we started working from home, we started shopping from home. The transition to online happened at a rate of knots. So I thought I had to do something else. But I thought this time, I won't just make it for the selling fraternity, the professional uh, type publication. I'll make it for the wider community because I see lots of kids out there who need to, to sort of rack up a few miles with conversational skill and practice and so on. So that's the purpose of the book. I'm, I'm trying to avert the threat of losing this wonderful present thing we have called interpersonal skills. Yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. I would advise all our listeners to definitely go and get a copy. It's it's a great read. And with that, Mr. Keith Rowe, I'd like to thank you for being our guest today. My and pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation and hopefully we can have another one about a few other topics later on. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's our pleasure. So we'll finish here today. You've been listening to 10 Lessons Learned. Our guest today has been Keith Rowe, sharing his 10 lessons that took him many years to learn. This episode is supported, as always, by the Professional Development Forum. Don't forget to leave us a review and comment on the show. Tell us what you think about today's lessons. You can even email us at podcast at 10lessonslearned.com. That's podcast at 10 lessonslearned.com go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of the only show on the internet that makes the world a little wiser lesson by lesson thank you and see you at the next episode